Prepare your heart for something amazing. Uh, that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, Emmanuel, God with us, has said to us, come to my table. He invites us. He invites you. If you're here in the courtyard or if you're in your car, I'd invite you to get your elements ready by taking your little communion uh, uh, kit there and uh, peel off the top piece, that, uh, that little top piece of plastic, get the, the wafer, the second piece of plastic there to have the cup ready. Just have those ready. If you're at home, if you would just gather your elements, uh, something, some juice, some wine, some bread, some crackers, and prepare your hearts to come to the table. This is an invitation for all followers of Jesus. Communion is Jesus' table. And if you've come to the cross, if you receive Jesus Christ, then you're welcome. He invites you. If you've had a bad day or a rough week and you haven't lived perfectly, you're still welcome. As a matter of fact, one of the great things about the bread and the cup is they were a reminder of grace. There's no better place to come if you've had a bad day or a bad week or a bad month than to the table of Jesus. Because at this table we remember that his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. Because he knows our brokenness. He came for it. He came to make it right. And in these elements we remember the greatness of his grace. If you're at home or here on campus and you've never received Jesus, I hope tonight would be the night. But if you've not yet received Jesus, I would encourage you just to not partake only because it doesn't make sense. You're not sure what this is all about yet. But talk with me or any of our pastors afterwards and say, boy, I, I want to know more about communion. I want to know more about knowing Jesus. And we would love to walk you through that and talk about that. But communion is really for those people who understand what it means. And we're going to think about the meaning of communion right now as we prepare to come to the table. Listen to these words from the book of Isaiah as he prophesied the coming of our Savior, Emmanuel, who would give his life for us. The prophet wrote, Surely he took our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him, this is a prophecy of Jesus, we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, we've gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. But the Lord has laid on him, on the Messiah, on Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Where does it say our sin will be placed? On Emmanuel, on Jesus, the Savior. And so sitting around the table with his disciples near the end of his life, Jesus took the cup. This is from Luke chapter 22, beginning in verse 17. Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks. And he said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And then he took the bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. As you hold in your hands, and if you're at home, I invite you just to hold in one hand the cup, and the other hand the bread or the cracker. If you're here in the, on campus, you have the elements. And just remember these realities. When Jesus first broke the bread and poured out the cup, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Just quiet your heart for a minute. And remember Jesus. Remember if you grew up in church, singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. Remember if you became a Christian as a teenager or an adult, the first time you realized, oh, this is real. He loves me. Remember all the times he's shown up when you were lonely or afraid. And no one else was there. And Jesus, Emmanuel, God with you, came alongside of you and was with you. Just quietly remember the presence of Jesus in your life.
And as you remember Jesus, remember that we come to the table as a family. We are part of the church universal all over the world. And if we're part of the church universal, then certainly we're one body here in Monterey, part of Shoreline. Some are at home. Some are in their cars. Some are in the courtyard. Some are traveling for business, but you took the time to get online and get the elements ready to partake. We are one family united, one body of Christ. So communion is communion with Jesus, but it's also communion with his family. So even as I'm talking now, as you're thinking about this, don't just look to Jesus, look around you. And remember, this, this, is, this is communion with these people who love to bring their instruments and their voices to lead in worship. Peek over the wall down the parking lot and see the other people. Say, we're, we're in this together. This is communion. We partake in a moment. We'll partake together as the body of Christ from home, from here on campus. And we partake to remember his grace. One of the terms that theologians use for the sacraments, for communion and for baptism, are gifts of grace. Because what we hold in our hands is a reminder of the grace of God a physical sign of the spiritual reality that the God of glory came to earth and fleshed as a real person. And on the cross, his body was broken. And on the cross, his blood was shed. And he knew us by name. He knew us by name. And so this bread which we break is our communion with the body of Jesus Christ. Look at the wafer you hold in your hand. Look at the bread you hold. And just quietly say, Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for being broken. Thank you that every ounce of healing I have is because you allowed yourself to be torn apart, to put me back together. And Jesus, I partake of this bread remembering you and your grace. Let's partake together. And the cup which we bless is our communion with the shed blood of Jesus Christ. As you hold the cup, as you think about Jesus at that table, he told his followers to remember him in this cup. And so take a moment and reflect on what Jesus did on the cross. And just tell him, Jesus, this cup I hold, will you remind me? Jesus, I wasn't there, but I've read the story. I've read your word. And your blood was shed the city, all the way up the hill called Golgotha and on the cross and you poured out your life for me Jesus you were poured out so you could fill me up and Jesus even as you came to this world and were there on that hillside you are here with me now Jesus as we partake of this cup together may we experience your presence and your grace let's partake together as a sign of our unity in Christ Jesus we remember your body broken we remember your blood shed we remember your sacrifice and as we remember we recognize the need we have for your grace and that right now you are here with us reminding us that your grace is still amazing now Lord prepare our hearts to open your word. Prepare our minds to understand in a deeper, richer way that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. Jesus, we meet you in this time. Meet with us. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, good evening, Shoreline. It's so great to be gathered together, isn't it? 
whether you're online or whether you're here in the parking lot or down here in the courtyard cozied up by one of those space heaters, what a great night for us to be able to gather together and worship God. As Kevin uh, mentioned earlier, we are looking at a central theme throughout the entire year at Night of Worship called What's in a Name? So far this year, we've looked at the different names of God. We've looked at God as He is the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. God's name, He is Advocate, He is Comforter, He is Holy Spirit. But that God, His name, He is the I Am, the Great I Am. And last month, Pastor Kevin shared with us what God, Jehovah Ra, God is our Shepherd. And this month, we're looking at Emmanuel, God with us. Just one word in Hebrew, but three words in English. Emmanuel, God with us. Now the Bible only uses that title three times, twice in the Old Testament and once in the New Testament. And I'm going to read that passage Pastor Kevin read earlier, but I want to read it again, Matthew 1, 20 through verses, excuse me, Matthew 1, 20 and 23. And in those verses, it says, but after, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And of course, that was the fulfillment of the prophecy from 700 years earlier that a Messiah would come, a Messiah would come to save his people. And Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, comes fully God, fully man, and comes to save his people. Now, it's a very familiar passage, Matthew 1. And unfortunately, sometimes familiarity can reduce the significance of the name Emmanuel. But his name, Emmanuel, is infinitely powerful and intimately personal. And it should astound us. It should move us. It should transform us. And it should humble us every day of our life. Charles Spurgeon, an English preacher from the 1800s, had this to say about the name Emmanuel. He says, Emmanuel, God with us. It is hell's terror. Satan trembles at the sound of it. Let Satan come to you suddenly and do you but whisper the word Emmanuel. And back he folds, confounded and confused. John Wesley, another English preacher who lived in the 1700s and the founder of the Methodist Church, as he was dying, the last words that he spoke were, the best of all is God with us, Emmanuel. Infinitely powerful, intimately personal, Emmanuel. God with us. And so as I prayed and prepared and pondered the impact of that name, Emmanuel, God with us, I came up with what I call four life-changing and mind-boggling implications of Emmanuel, God with us. Implication number one is that God came for us. God came for us. The same God who created the universe and everything in it. The same God that walked with Adam and Eve in the garden and whose heart was broken when they fell into sin. The same God who appeared to Moses in a burning bush. The same God who, who led the Israelites by day by a, a pillar of cloud and by night a pillar of fire. The same God that parted the Red Sea for the Israelites. The same God who destroyed enemy armies and leveled cities and performed miracle after miracle after miracle to protect and preserve his people. That same God, he came for you and he came for me. 
He came to rescue us. The Apostle Paul writes to the Galatian church in chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul writes these words, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. See, Jesus willingly left the glory of heaven to come to rescue us, to rescue you, to rescue me, to rescue us from the penalty of sin, the penalty of sin, which is death and eternal separation from him. He came to rescue us from the power of sin and the grip of the enemy, Satan, and his influence over us. Jesus came for the greatest rescue mission ever told. And you and I were part of that. The greatest rescue mission ever. And I think sometimes we might forget that. But yet we'll watch on TV and we'll read about these great stories of rescue. When people are surrounded, hopeless, helpless, nowhere to turn, nowhere to run. And suddenly something changes. Someone comes to rescue them. Jesus did that for us. The God of the universe, amen, amen. And how, a question for us then tonight is, how are we expressing our gratitude and thankfulness for that on a daily basis? Do we forget that we were rescued and all that we were rescued from? So for maybe each one of us, maybe it's a song of thanks. Maybe it's when we sing these worship songs that we, we, we have a new appreciation to be reminded of what he rescued us from and what he did for us. Or maybe it's just a simple prayer of thanks on your daily drive-in to work. And maybe it's as simple as Jesus. Thank you for rescuing me. Thank you for rescuing me. A simple prayer. Eternally grateful for what he did for us. Emmanuel, God with us. Implication number two of Emmanuel, God with us, is that God made a way for us. You see, God came for us and he made a way for us to be with him. We read in 2 Timothy Chapter 1, verses 9 through 10. It says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, but because of His own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Jesus, he made a way for us. He made a way. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death for us. And in the power of his resurrection, he made a way for us to be with him eternally. And when we receive his grace, when we say yes to Jesus Christ's invitation to receive his grace, we say, Jesus, I follow you all the days of my life. I give my life to you. And when we do that, Jesus, he gives us a new eternity. Think about that. A new eternity. We were moving this direction on an eternity spent separated from our creator and Jesus made a way so that we receive him and our eternity is changed. An eternity with him. And Jesus also gives us a new identity. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. We have a new identity. We're no longer defined by our past failures our faults, and all the things we did before. Jesus makes us new 
a new creation, the Apostle Paul says. We're also no longer defined by the world. We are now defined as a beloved child of God. Beloved. Beloved. And we also have a new family. I love what Pastor Kevin said in communion. That when we say yes to Jesus, we have a new family. A body of believers. Brothers and sisters in Christ that come around us. As you look around tonight, and even if you're at home online, you are part of a family. And when you say yes to Jesus, you have a new family. And it is a forever family that you share life with. The ups, the downs, the highs, lows, the joys, the sorrows. And yes, even in times of global pandemics. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. Amen. And lastly, we get a new priorities. Oh, Jesus gives us new priorities, does he not? Jesus says, love the Lord your God first and love others second and love yourself last. Doesn't mean you think so much less of yourself, but you, you think of God first. He's your first priority. You help others. You serve others. New priorities. And the question then is, why us? Was it because we were so good and we are so good? No. No. Paul tells us, no, it's because of God's sovereign purpose and his grace that he chose us. His love, his mercy, his forgiveness, and his favor, he chose us. And so a question for us tonight, church, is how are you experiencing his grace and extending it to others? How are you experiencing his grace and extending it to others? Now, I would never ask a question that I'm also not wrestling with myself. And so uh, I, this morning, I went out for a hike. One of the ways that I connect with God is being in nature and finding times of prayer. And so this morning, I was out and I was, I was processing my sermon and I was up and hiking through the, the woods. And I kept asking, I was like, like, Lord, how am I experiencing your grace? And how can I be more gracious to others? And this is what the, the Lord put on my heart. This is the prayer that I want to mark the rest of my life every day. I want you to listen to this. I believe it's from the Lord because it has a melody and I'm not musical at all. Father, today, let me experience your grace in greater measure and let me extend that grace to those I encounter. Let me say that again. Let me experience your grace in greater measure and let me extend that grace to those I encounter. I, wanna, I want that prayer to be on my lips the rest of my life, every day, as I am experiencing God's grace and I'm extending that grace to others. And I hope that that would be your prayer as well, that you would be praying for a fresh experience every day of God's grace. And in return, then, you would extend that grace to others. Emmanuel, God with us. The third implication is that God cares for us. God cares for us. He created us in love, and he cares for us in love. He came for us. He made a way for us, and this is what he didn't do. He didn't say, you're all on your own now. You figure it out. God cares so much for us, for us that when we place our faith in Jesus Christ, he literally takes up residence in us through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's how much he cares for us. God himself dwells within us. God himself, through the work of the Holy Spirit, he comforts us, he challenges us, he convicts us, and when need us, he corrects us and he calls us to his own in love. It's to grow, to be more like him in every aspect of our lives. And two verses in particular that have really been more meaningful than so many other verses in the Bible, but every verse, obviously, every, every verse of the Bible is God-breathed. 
But two verses in particular that have really helped me in times of of real trials and real struggles, whether it's a combat deployment or whether it's searching for my son in the middle of the night as I was hiking up a hill with my other son who was lost somewhere in the Ventana wilderness. These two verses really reminded me that God cares for me. Romans 8, verses 28 and 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So no matter what we're going through or what we will ever go through, God has a purpose. And we can trust that he is working for our ultimate good, no matter what we're going through. Amen? It's to grow us, as the verse says, to be conformed to the image of his son. It's to grow us, to shape us, to mold us, to be more like Jesus. In every situation, in every circumstance, in every aspect of our lives. That's how much he cares for us. And so church, tonight, I want to ask, how are you trusting and actively growing to be more like him? How are you trusting him in the season you're in, and how are you actively growing to be more like him? Maybe you're seeking his comfort. Maybe you're seeking strength or wisdom. Maybe you're asking him to guide you or protect you or to help you, sometimes even to help redirect you. And so the question would be is how are we spending time with him? How are we spending time with him? See, the creator of the universe, God Almighty, he desires to be with us. He longs for us to spend time with him. And so maybe it's for you, it's spending time in God's word, his very God-breathed word. It's studying, it's reading, or maybe it's on your drive in to work, it's listening to God's word. Or maybe it's quiet times in prayer. It's prayer while you're driving. A prayer like me when you're hiking. Or maybe for some of you, it's prayer while you're swimming. And the great news is we can do it with our eyes open. I would hope you're driving, praying with your eyes open, amen? And for some of you, you might tonight say, well, it's a real struggle for me. You know, Pastor Sean, it's a real struggle for me to find time or just to really connect with God. Well, we, we've tried to make it as, as accessible and as easy for you. Uh, Sherry and her team, they've developed a, a assessment that actually the spiritual pathways assessment that's on our website, and many of you have already taken that assessment and you have discovered how you best connect with God. And what we've heard is that people love that assessment and it really has been life-changing and transformational in their times with God. And if you've not yet done that, I really want to encourage you, whether you're here or you're online, to go on our website and look for that spiritual pathways assessment. I really want to encourage you. That helps you connect with God to spend time with the God who cares for you. Emmanuel. God with us. Implication number four is that God has a mission for us. God has a mission for us. And so many people, they really struggle with finding purpose and meaning and and a mission that's greater than themselves, don't they, in life? But if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus makes it clear that he has a mission for each and every one of his followers. We call it the Great Commission, and it's found in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Can you imagine the disciples? Jesus is getting ready to ascend to heaven. And Jesus says, here's the mission statement. And listen to Jesus' final words here. He says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus continues the rescue mission. And how does Jesus continue the rescue mission for the rest of the world? 
He continues the rescue mission through us, his disciples. He commissions us to love people in his name, to care for people in his name, and to share the gospel, the good news in his name. And that word commission, that's not a word that we use every day. But in this case, I think it's important that we understand what that word means. Webster defines a commission as an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or group of people. It also goes on to say that the commission is a lawful extension of a sovereign power and can only be revoked by that power. Brothers and sisters, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, he has commissioned you as the king of kings, there is no higher or more sovereign power in all of the universe. And he has commissioned each one of us. And what I love about that word commission and about that definition is that that commission can only be revoked by that power. Which means the commission, it's a continuous mission. In the military, you used to go through training exercises, and you'd be assigned a mission, and you would go out and you'd execute that mission. And at some point in the training exercise, you would hope, if you were exhausted and tired, that somebody would say, change a mission, change a mission. And eventually, you'd get to end of mission. Well, folks, we didn't get a change of mission and there is no end of mission for us until Jesus calls us home or Jesus returns, amen? We also know that the commission is, it's a co-mission. Did you get Jesus' final words? Surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. We don't go alone. He goes with us, Emmanuel, God with us. We go in his presence and in his power. And the commission also then is, it's everlasting. It's every day and it's for every follower of Jesus. There's no exemptions. It's every stage of life, from young to not so young. It's for every place we serve. It's in our homes, it's in our neighborhoods, it's in our workplaces and our military bases. It's in our preschools and it's in our college campuses. It's even at City Hall to our nation's capital and everywhere in between. It's for every profession and interaction. And each time we go out, we're going out sent by Emmanuel, God with us. Every opportunity is an opportunity to share Jesus in some way, shape, or form with someone who doesn't yet know Jesus. And so our final question tonight is, do you see yourself as on mission wherever the Lord calls or leads you? Do you see yourself as on mission wherever he leads you? Now, what might that look like for you? I don't know exactly what that would look like for you, but maybe it's praying for your neighbor who's struggling with life. Or maybe it's while you're out and you see someone who's in need and you decide to go give, help them out. Maybe it's to encourage someone that you see who's working really hard and just a word of encouragement. Maybe it's to thank someone. You're out at a restaurant and a waiter or a waitress gives you amazing service. How about you thank them and give them a generous tip? Maybe it's even to invite someone to church with you even if it's inviting them to online. And if the Lord were to offer the opportunity, it's to enter into a spiritual conversation and to share your rescue story and the story of Jesus. And so in a moment, we're going to have a special time of commissioning. We're going to ask you, if you're a follower of Jesus, in your different areas your spheres of influence, the places you go, the work that you do, the people that you come around, that in that commissioning time, we're gonna ask you to stand and we are going to commission you as an ambassador of Christ.
to go out and share the gospel, to carry on the mission that he has given us. So imagine the difference. Imagine the difference that we could make here at Shoreline Church for the kingdom if every one of us took Jesus' words to heart and we faithfully carried out the mission wherever he sends us, wherever he calls us. Emmanuel, God with us. Let us live in and out of that reality, not just at Christmas time, but for the rest of our lives. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you, Jesus, that you, you came for us, that you made a way for us, that you care for us, and that you have given us a mission for life. Jesus, who are we that you would call us unto your own? We thank you for your grace, and Lord, I thank you for each one of my brothers and sisters tonight. And I pray, Lord, that you would stir in their hearts a renewed sense, a renewed joy in the mission that you call us in to go and make disciples. Jesus, we love you and we thank you in your name. Amen. 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 So we have a gift coming your way. Yeah, you can say praise the Lord for that. Amen. So we have a gift for you, and that gift is that God would by his spirit, commission you. We got a whole row of pastors over here. We got a boatload of pastors, all right? And they are ready to commission you. And so as each one comes up, they're going to tell you uh, what specific group they want to commission. You may find in the next few minutes that two or three of those groups you fit into. If more than one group is you, we invite you to stand up again for that one. Now, I know some of you are bundled up and you're cozied up. You got blankets here. I'm going to ask you still, if, if you, this applies, and if it applies to you and you're willing to say, I want to go on mission along with Emmanuel. I want to go on mission in this part, and I want to make myself available to be used by him in the world. If it comes to each thing and that's you, I invite you to stand up. If you're at home, I want to ask you to stand up. If you can't physically stand, we understand, then just if you can't physically stand, turn your hands upward like this to receive this commissioning. If you're in your car, just turn your, if it's you, turn your hands upward and receive that way. At home in the car, your hands in the, in the courtyard, in the home, if you're able, let's stand. And also I want to say this. I know for a lot of people, in a moment like this, where you say, well, you're going to say, so, so the first group, just so you know, the first group is going to be military, first responders, and government workers. That could be school teachers in the public schools. If you're in any of those things, in a moment, we're going to pray for that group, commission that group. When Roy announces that, I'm going to invite you to stand up. Now, some people are going to say this. Well, you know, my, my faith is private. I'm not going to stand up in front of other people. Can I tell you something? As your pastor, the Christian faith is not a private faith. Amen. It's a public faith. It's, now listen, it's deeply personal, but it's not private. And to be in the community of God's people, to stand up and to let somebody in the name of Jesus commission you is a gift. And so pastors, are you ready to bring us a gift and to commission us? And if anything that applies to me, I'm going to stand and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit speak to me and challenge me. So Pastor Roy, would you begin our time of commissioning? Go ahead. Well, for those among us from the military and first responder communities, desiring to be light and salt in your spheres of influence, I invite you to stand. Lord, these are frontline people. More than that, they are your frontline representatives. And may your mantle of courage and conviction Rest readily upon them as they light up their world with your truth and your grace. Whether stooping to serve or standing strong to protect, may your brand of peace prevail. And may they always have an answer for the hope which they hold, always delivered with gentleness and a humble heart. Lord, I pray that you would send them out as ministers of the gospel into a harsh and hurting world. Amen and amen. If you're in the medical field in any capacity or the mental health field in any capacity and you have it in your heart to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the light, love, and the hope that he and only he brings with others in your life, would you please stand now? Medical, 
field, mental health field in any way. It's an honor to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would bless these workers in these fields because, Father, they need it every day. They need a fresh infilling of your strength and your direction, your guidance, your wisdom, your resilience, your perseverance, Father, in every situation from mild to, to great strain. Father, would you help them and heal them and bring them peace, Father, as they do what you've called them to do in their heart to help the hurting. And then also, Lord, would you work through them? Would you work through them to reach the lives of those they serve and even those they work with who may not know you, to bring that same hope and light and love and peace and grace to those they serve so that their life and what they display would make a difference, Father. So we ask you to bless them and send them out as ministers of your gospel. And we pray this in the holy and precious name of the one who gave everything that we would be redeemed, Jesus Christ, amen. And I've got kind of a broad area that I get to invite you to stand. If you find yourself in the marketplace, a workplace with, with customers, with business transactions, uh, with vendors, with contractors, I invite you to stand as I pray a blessing over you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these individuals who are ready to be on mission for you in the workplace. Lord, as they, they go to their places of business and they bring hope, they bring joy. Lord, we pray that you would give them a, a sense of integrity in their business dealings. Lord, we pray that you would show them how to, how to be a voice with their employees, with their supervisors, with their coworkers, with their clients, with their contractors. Lord, and as the time is right, we pray that you would give them the words to speak, words of hope, words of affirmation, words of encouragement that would ultimately lead the people they interact with to relationship with you. Father, we send these people out, commissioned by you to be on mission in their workplaces. We pray this in Jesus' name. And if you're in the world of education, if you're a teacher or an administrator, if you're teaching homeschool, if you're in the front office, if you're in any way in part of that world, I just invite you to, to stand and, and let me pray for you. Lord, I just commission all these people who are standing, who are at home or in their car, Lord, in this here in this space, Lord, that they would be a minister of the gospel for you. Lord, in the, in the place that they work in education, Lord, we know that that can be tough, that they have to balance. So, Lord, we pray that you would give them wisdom, Lord, when to uh, just express love, Lord, and wisdom when to boldly proclaim your word, boldly proclaim your gospel. Lord, I pray for them as they grade papers and as they do work with children and as they do different things, Lord, give them supernatural insight to be able to pray and to be able to speak life into students of all types, Lord, to coworkers. Lord, we pray that you would bless them, Lord. You would use them for your honor, for your glory, Lord, and that you would just spread your Holy Spirit over their lives, Lord, in a way that they are able to make a difference and impact for you, Lord, as they uh, just struggle and look and work and strive. Lord, and just pray your blessing. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. And if you are an elementary age kid, if you are a middle school student, a high school student, if you are in uh, college, post-grad, I'm going to ask you to stand. If you want to just proclaim Jesus to your campus, if you want to go be the salt and light to those campuses, please stand. And I'm going to pray this over you. Lord Jesus, we love you. And I just pray for every single kid, every student who is standing right now, God, that they would want to go on to their school campus and boldly proclaim your name. God, that everybody that they encounter from friends to teachers to coaches, God, that they would know that there's something different about them and that is you living in them. And God, I pray that there's going to be so many people 
that will experience who you are and will be in heaven one day because these students that are standing right now that want to go out and live their life on mission. So God, I commission them to go out onto their school campuses and to the things they love and the people they encounter to make a difference for your kingdom. Pray all this in your name. Amen. As a sign of your desire to model Christ to your kids and your grandkids, I want to invite parents and grandparents to please stand. Jesus, we commission this group that is standing to be a representative of you to their kids and grandkids. And Lord, we ask that you bless and sustain them. Give them open ears, open hearts, and a radical confidence that only comes from you. So that when opportunities arise to boldly and confidently speak your love into the lives that you have entrusted them with, they can do that. Lord, we send this group of people out that is standing to be ministers of the gospel for their families. In your name, Jesus. Amen. As a sign of your desire to represent Jesus in any of the spaces and places where you live, and spaces and places where you spend time personally, socially, recreationally, and even virtually, will you stand? And as you're standing, let me help clarify. If you wanna be a representative for Jesus in your neighborhood, in the nursing home, in apartment complexes or barracks, the areas around where you live, maybe it's in the places where you shop, you get your hair cut, places where you pick up your morning coffee or you grab a bite to eat or even a place where you go walk your dog and those who go into recreational spaces to basketball courts and tennis courts and gyms and fitness clubs and golf clubs and any other recreational area you go and if you would say I will be so bold to even go into social spaces to hang out with my friends and virtual spaces, places where I text and places where I go on and post and places where I tweet and even places where I game. If that's you, will you stand and be a representative for Jesus in those spaces? Lord Jesus, you have called us into this world, a world that's unlike any other time of history, but Lord, you called us to go into this world. And so Jesus, standing before you, we commission these brothers and sisters, men, women, children, all ages, all areas, wherever they go, wherever we go, may we be found faithful as we bring the message of truth and hope and grace. And Lord, we pray all this, that we would not go out in our own strength, but we would be reminded that we go with you, and you are with us. So Jesus, send us out in your power and your presence. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I just want to remind you to carry this moment in your heart, because Jesus is here. He's Emmanuel, God with us right now. And he will carry this moment in his heart. And he will whisper to you. Sean, I love when you said, even gaming. <laughs> um, the Spirit of God will whisper to your heart, this is the moment. Shine my light. This is the moment. Don't retaliate, but show grace. This is the moment. Have a conversation. There's nothing better than being on a mission if it's a mission that has eternal implications. 
People live a whole lifetime and wonder, is there anything I do that makes a real difference? Well, everything you do for Jesus makes an eternal difference. And he is Emmanuel. When Jesus commissioned his disciples in Matthew 28, he said, you go therefore. I love Jesus says, all authority and heaven on earth, Jesus says, all authority and heaven on earth is given to me, Jesus says. So you go <laughs> and make disciples of all nations. Think about it. Jesus said, all authority and heaven on earth, Jesus says, is mine. And now you go. Why would he say that? Because they went with him. The power goes with you when you go with Jesus, and Jesus is always with you. Amen? And so, Lord Jesus, as we respond now, with our hearts filled with an encouragement to shine your light, to be your people, to share your love, to tell your stories, to tell our stories. Lord, as we close our time just singing praise to you, will you be lifted up and glorified? And we would dare to pray, Lord, would you fill us up right now so that we can go and overflow.